Yeah, next question. There's a crowd in here too. <laughs> 45. <laughs> so. The control room is full. The uh, the loo is full. Everything is there. Behind the screen, they're everywhere. It's called riot time. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, moving right along, I must say that uh, in my experience of uh, doing lectures like this literally all over the world, I find I have to tell uh, people some fundamentals about what their life about. I shouldn't have to. I go around the world telling people things they should know already, like the sky is not falling and Elvis is dead. I, mean, I, I see some surprised faces here. I'm sorry to reveal that to you. But it's true. Dead, 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 like this. Now, I'm a conjurer by trade. You were told that. I'm a magician. That is, I come out in front of people, and I perform for them, uh, deceiving them purposely for purposes of entertainment. I try to do that because um, I'm an entertainer. I'm an actor playing the part of a wizard. I think that it's rather stimulating to know that you can be deceived, and you've seen the conjurers. There's some in our audience tonight, I'm happy to say. And as a matter of fact, uh, the, where is the, uh, the, 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 the wizard? Where, where are you, wizard? Uh, right back there, sitting in the aisle, that diminutive man. Stand up and take a bow. He's without his hat, but I'm sure you'll recognize it. I don't know many uh, towns that have their own personal local wizard. Uh, I don't know how official that is, but I'll accept it. It, it is a fa Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I'm very glad to hear that. Congratulations, sir. Now, um, when I, I travel around the world, I tell people, gee, you know, you can easily be fooled. And they say, oh, sure, yeah, I can. And sometimes I demonstrate that they can be fooled. But more often, I demonstrate that they fool themselves. Now, I'm going to tell you something the magicians have known for a long time. I'm sure they'll all agree with me on this, that uh, you're in the habit of deceiving yourself. You're in the habit of making assumptions. Oh, I see some faces there saying, not me. Oh, I would never make an assumption, right? No, you would never make an assumption, right? Well, what about when you go to cross the street? You see, in any city around the world, there's sort of a universal thing. It's called a traffic light, and it's red, and it's amber, and it's green. And you know what those signs mean. You know, the green means go, the red means stop, and the yellow means go like hell. <laughs> and that's sort of universal all over the world. You won't find a place anywhere in the world where this process is reversed. Well, except in New York City, which they don't mean anything, and you just cross and get run over anyway. But uh, there are exceptions, of course, to every rule. But you make the assumption, and correctly so, in most cases, you make the assumption that you can cross when the light turns green. But you also make other assumptions that you don't even think of. As you cross the street, you assume that the street will not turn into strawberry jello under your, under your hands, under your feet. You know, you're not going to go in right up to your waist in it, that you're not going to sink out of sight, that a meteorite won't fall on you, a few things like that. You make those assumptions because they're pretty safe to make. Now, you folks, when you came in here, I stepped out here, I picked up the microphone, and I began to talk to you. So I'm actually connected to another little radio mic here, which is connected to the videotape machine up there. Am I coming through all right? I, he does this. Is that a good sign? I know this isn't, but this is probably okay. Very good. Now, um, that's true. I, I am using this little radio mic, uh, which is connected to the videotape machine up there. But there's another assumption you made. You see, um, this uh, mic is not what you're hearing, and this is actually a remote control for the slide projector up there. <laughs> I'm not using that at all. I just wanted to show you folks that you do make assumptions about the world. The real microphone is right down under my tie here. You probably didn't notice that. So I'll put both of them out on top, and you'll probably hear me a little bit better now. Hello? Oh, yes. All right, there we go. I can put this, embed this on my hip or something now. There we go. Now, actually, I've been talking into this little microphone under my tie. That's an assumption that won't cost you anything. Won't cost you any money. It won't cost you any emotional stability. And it certainly won't cost you your health or your life, but there are assumptions that you make every day which may do just that. I'm going to be showing you some videotapes a little later. And when I do, I'm going to warn you that you have a, a couple of rather startling experiences in front of you. During the evening as well, I will try to demonstrate some of the things that the so-called psychics do. 
Oh, they are psychics, all right, but then it depends on what your definition of psychic is. A psychic would be a person who has paranormal, supernatural powers. In some cases, they claim these are divine powers. They claim these powers are given to them and them alone. Other psychics claim that everybody has the power. Let's handle one aspect of it and get, that, get, get it finished with right off the very top, I think, because it's a very common claim. The claim of water dowsing, divining, if you will. Now, you've seen films, no doubt. You may have even seen the actual practitioners walking about with a fork stick held in a position like this. And they say they can find water under the ground. They can. It's amazing. Of course, so can you. You can do it simply by sticking a pin in a map or throwing a stone up in the air. Because 94% of the Earth's surface has water within drillable distance. It's not too hard to do. Your chances of being successful are about 94%. Now, my challenge to the dowsers, the water diviners, those that find water under the ground by means of a fork stick, has always been very simple. Find me a dry spot. <laughs> For some reason, or other, they don't seem to want to do that because the chances of being successful are about 6%. You see? Now, seriously, folks, I want to tell you something about the water diviners, the people with the fork sticks and with the pendulums and the coat hanger wires and whatnot, who go diddling about in fields and saying, oh, oh, there's water down there. It's 21 and a half feet down there. Uh, you want that in centimeters? Well, it doesn't make any difference. It's right down there, and there's a vast underground river flowing there. Folks, there are no vast underground rivers. They seem to think that the Amazon, you know, is immediately beneath their feet in a great gush of water. They can hear it roaring down there. Water travels along from point to point under the ground at an average speed of about a quarter of a mile a year. That's the rate at which this vast underground river is flowing. It seeps through rocks and through gravel and through sand. Oh, mind you, if you tap it, that will increase the velocity somewhat of it just seeping through the earth. There are artesian wells down there. They're common in this part of the world. And they're a main source of water for many farmers and for many industrial applications, sure. There's water under the ground. It's all over the place. Well, when you test the dowsers, can they do what they say they can do? The answer is, quite simply, no. Unfortunately, they can. But why do so many people believe that it's true? Now, there must be some germ of truth. There must be something happening here. I mean, after all, they walk along and the stick does dip down. Well, there are only two questions to ask about dowsing. Only two questions. A, can one dowser find the same spot twice? B, can two dowsers find the same spot independently? We have tested this again and again, endlessly, all over the world, and the answer to the first question is no, and to the second question is no. It's that simple. They simply can't do it. I came back from Kassel, Germany last year after doing a very definitive test of dowsers, and I, I've got to show you just how honest these folks are. They're honest, but they're self-deluded. We had a test set up, well, first of all, for water and a pipe traveling underneath the tent. And there was either water flowing in it or no water flowing in it. It was like being pregnant. It was or wasn't, you know. You didn't have to say how much water, how fast. We had a mark on the ground, red and white tape going along the ground, said exactly where the pipe was. It was 50 centimeters down. They saw it being buried. They saw that by turning a valve in the little shed outside, after arriving at a random choice by choosing a ping pong ball out of a bag of 20 ping pong balls, half of them black, half of them white. They either turned the water to go through the, the pipe underneath the tent or around the tent. But the dowsers, when they knew, when they could look at the valve and see which way it was turned, they always had 100% results. They were always right. And then, that was to establish the baseline. When you know it, it always works. And the stick would just twist out of their arms. Whoa! There it is. Wow. Zoom. Well, then we did it the same number of times again, only this time we closed the door to the shed. We didn't know ourselves whether or not the water was flowing, but we had a constant videotape record being made of it. Guess what score they got? 50% over a period of three days. 50% right, 50% wrong. Is that surprising? No, not to me, because I've been in this business a long time, folks. I didn't fall off an apple tree yesterday. I've been doing this thing with hundreds of dowsers. But the thing I wanted to tell you about this particular test is we had an auxiliary test going at the same time. Some people said, oh, I can't find water. It means nothing to me. I only find gold or oil or coal or copper or zinc or whatever. They all brought along their favorite samples. 
samples to which their dowsing stick would react. And we would take 10 boxes, little opaque plastic boxes, and we would take a counter out of the bag, it says number seven, put it in box number seven, close all the lids, go along, boom, down came the stick at box number seven. Then we repeated it many, many times, and then we did the same number of tests when it was arrived at by a randomizing process, the same sort of thing, but they didn't know. And they got one out of 10. But the one astonishing thing, and this shows you how honest these folks are, there was one elderly gentleman there. We put it in box number three. He closed all the boxes, and he took his dowsing stick, and he went down, and the stick came down, boom, on box number two. He looked around. I said, oh, it's, it's in box number three. Ah, yeah. <laughs> he came down again, and boom, down it went at box number three this time. He didn't see any anomaly here at all. To him, that was perfectly explainable. <laughs> they just simply made a mistake. <laughs> now, by the same token, you say to yourself, well, there are probably people that are much more sophisticated than the dowsers. Maybe these are just innocent bumpkins. No, in many cases, they're professors of physics and philosophy, all this sort of thing, who really believe they've got the power. It's what we call, in psychology, an ideomotor effect. It's something that you're doing but you don't realize that you're really the person doing it. You are really controlling it, and you're totally unconscious of it. To give you an example of how innocent some of these folks are, I was in Beijing, China, about a year and a half ago. And we were introduced to some Qigong artists, and these are people who have whole hospitals dedicated to their work. It includes acupuncture, the meridians, qi, all of these strange oriental ideas. And believe me, they're very sound philosophical ideas, but in reality, they don't apply. We showed that very forcefully. There was a lady there who was brought in from the far reaches of China at great expense who was China's greatest Qigong diagnostician. What does that mean? Well, it means that she's in the trade of, believe it or not, diagnosing people at a great distance away. And the way they do it is they simply send her a little slip of paper with their name written on it. And she takes a slip of paper, doesn't even read the name, just holds it in her hand. She diagnoses these people. Someone writes out a prescription, puts it in the envelope, and they send it back. She says she's 100% success. Never failed in her whole life. She's a 100% success, really. Well, that should be easy enough to test, right? Very easy to test. I gave her two slips of paper. I said, on that one is the name of my mother. On this one is the name of my sister. Now, my family, all of my, my relatives, all lived together in Toronto, Canada. And we were doing this in the evening. I said, it's a certain hour of the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, back home in Toronto. Telephone right here in the hotel room. We can call them up, and we'll find out whether your diagnosis is correct. She said, oh, well, no problem at all. Through the interpreter, of course, she took a piece of paper, and held it. she said, uh, uh, this was my mother. She said, uh, oh, this lady is too heavy, far too heavy, and she's, uh, she's got a very uh, thinning hair, and her hair is all white, and she, um, it's not too difficult so far. I can't really argue with that. And she um, has a heaviness in the chest, a lot of trouble breathing. She takes great deep breaths every now and then, and she has very bad back pains in her vertebrae, and she should take, and she went and gave us all a number of herbs, and including snake bile, which I don't think my mother would take under any circumstances. <laughs> and uh, you know what the main, main use of snake bile is in China, do you? It's used for snakes. They need some bile, so they... Um, <laughs> got him again. Just him. <laughs> I asked him er earlier if he knew the major use of sheepskins in the United States. He said, no, I said covering sheep. <laughs> It's true. Otherwise, they get dry, you know. They're dry, and it's, it's terrible. Naked sheep walking around, whoo, you know. <laughs> so she was holding this piece of paper in hand. She gave us this diagnosis. I said, is that all? She says, yes, but she should take this medicine right away because she can be in serious trouble. I gave her the one for my sister, and she held that in her hand. She said, uh, oh, this lady is also too heavy, and she has uh, great pains in her legs and in her lower back, and she also has trouble with the respiration, and she moves around very slowly. And I sense she's got a, a great problem in her throat here. She must have a great problem in her throat and, and, and teeth, her lower jaw. The teeth in her lower jaw are very, very bad, and she's got to have something done about that. I said, okay. She said, well, uh, how successful was that? Now, she said a moment ago she was 100% successful, right? Now, these folks are not lying to you. They really think they're 100% successful because nine times out of ten or more, they don't get any feedback. They never hear from these people to whom they send this diagnosis because it's not the oriental way, the Asiatic way, really, to write and criticize somebody who has done something for you like this. You don't do it. That's all there is to it. They don't 
send feedback. And of course, if they're dead, they don't send feedback. Well, what was the truth of the matter? First of all, my mother has been dead for many years. And she was in a jar on the mantelpiece. She'd been cremated a long time ago. No wonder she had trouble breathing. I can understand that. <laughs> because there is a tight lid on it, believe me. You wouldn't want your mother leaking all over the living room. And I'm not making fun of mom. I'm just saying that she was used as a, as a test article in this thing. My sister weighs 116 pounds at the last time I saw her. Bicycles six miles to work every day and back. In perfect health and plays tennis every weekend she can possibly afford it. She is not heavy with the pains and the whole thing. And I looked at the lady who was smiling away, and I said, well, it seems that both of these diagnoses failed. And she said, well, they were incorrect. That's right. Well, you said you were 100% correct up until this moment. She says, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, no, I never fail. I said, well, you just did fail. I'm trying to get through the, the, the language barrier, obviously, between the two of us. And she said, oh, no, this is a case where the process didn't work. But she's not wrong. The process didn't work. This is the kind of reasoning, or lack thereof, that these people go through. Our Chinese interpreter, John Ding, bless him, he's in the United States now, living there as a political refugee, as a matter of fact. He was the leader of the, um, the student movement at the time of the Tiananmen Square massacre. And he now has refuge in the United States. And poor John, he, t <laughs> he turned to me and he said, this parapsychologist just said something and the Chinese parapsychologist we were working with who was testing children who could read the characters on little slips of paper folded up and put in their armpits. They could also do it when they sat on the slips of paper, which may indicate an abnormal development of the retinal nerve, I'm not sure. <laughs> Whatever it was, this parapsychologist believed it implicitly and had written many articles for learned magazines about it. And so I said to John Ding, I said, well, what did he say to you? He said, I can't really translate it. He says, in effect, that sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. That's true. But he said, most of the time, he said, this is where I don't get it. Most of the time when they're wrong, it's simply because they're not correct. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Ding, don't worry. That's parapsychology talk for you. He said, that's all right. And I said, that's all right. He said, okay. And we went on, and pretty soon he came up with even more astonishing statements, but I just looked at him, and he'd say, parapsychology talk, that's parapsychology talk, and we'd just let it go by. These people are very strange, folks. Parapsychology is a science, yes. It's a science without any repeatable experiments, without one positive experiment in the whole history of the science. It's the only science like that. Wouldn't you think that a parapsychologist who um, was taking up his profession might think he could get out of this line of work? It's very much like a doctor. Been in business for years and years, and every one of his patients has died. Wouldn't you think this guy would start to think of becoming a plumber or something like that? <laughs> now, anything else that he might be successful at. But the parapsychologists go right ahead. They say, oh, well, another failure. Back to the old grindstone. They're looking for a truth, and I don't blame them. I mean, I wish them every bit of luck. But you've got to do it the right way, and you've got to reach a point where you say, I think maybe there's nothing to this. And we know of a couple of parapsychologists, Susan Blackmore, for example, who stayed in the business about 10 or 11 years. She looked around her and said, I think I'm barking up the wrong tree. I think there's nothing here. And she got out of the business, and we were very happy for her, but the parapsychologist, traitor, traitor, you're supposed to spend all of your life in it, a totally useless life, and end up never having come to a positive conclusion. That's their opinion. Now, when I look into these things, now, I'm a, you understand I have no academic credentials whatsoever. I come before you totally unencumbered by any academic degrees. I don't have any dean to answer to in the morning. I don't have to go in and say, I shouldn't have said that. You're absolutely right, you see. But I do say some things that I shouldn't, and therefore I get sued. I was just sued uh, last month for 39 million American dollars in the United States, which, believe me, is not a realistic figure to sue me for. <laughs> it's true. I would have had to go into the back of the car down by the cushions and get all that extra change out of there to even come anywhere near that, you see. And the jury found that I had defamed this man, and there were four charges. There were four things that I was supposed to pay him for, uh, you know, emotional instability, all that sort of thing, and sorrow and grief and all those things for saying something nasty about him. And uh, then there was a loss of uh, employability, you see. Yeah, that was a terrible thing that cost him. And uh, there was a punishment, you see, just punitive damages and such. And then there was loss of reputation in the community and such. And the jury gave him on the first one zero, and the second one zero, the third one zero, and the fourth one zero. I was very happy with that. 
because really it meant if I'd been found innocent, he could have appealed it and I'd go back to court for another two years. Now, uh, the lawyers are into me for a lot of money. If you want to hear my lawyer jokes, stay afterwards. There's uh, going to be a, an extra session of nothing but lawyer jokes, and they're all cruel. Uh, <laughs> but I, I must say, I have had some very good lawyers working for me. Lawyers that came to me and said, Mr. Randy, you don't deserve to pay those legal fees. Uh, I'll work for you for zero. And not only that, I've had good friends like the New Zealand skeptics who uh, a while back, a couple of years back, held a fire walk. And maybe some of you people came to that fire walk and they charged admission and they made some money to send to the fund that is helping to defend me in the United States. I'm not pleading poverty. I'm not, uh, not look, coming to, before you with great tears in my eyes or anything like that. But it shows that people from all over the world believe that some of the things I do at least are worthwhile doing and should be supported. Now I want to thank the New Zealand skeptics very, very sincerely. That's one reason that I'm in New Zealand right now, and I thank them sincerely from this very stage. <laughs> now, I promised that I would demonstrate a few things for you, after which I'm going to show you a videotape. The videotape I show you is rather, well, it's, it's entertaining to a certain extent, but it certainly is very infuriating when, when you hear the news that I tell you immediately after you see the first cut of the videotape. Uh, I don't know whether any of you folks have seen me doing the dumb spoon trick on TV, but it is a d dumb thing. What do you do for a living? I break spoons. Oh, really? Yeah, how useful, you know? I, I study the sex life of the amoeba. Oh, that's fascinating, too. I mean, uh, friends, I, I'm a very easy guy to get along with, you know, but uh, it turns out that when people ask what I do for a living, I appear in front of people and I bend and break spoons. That doesn't sound like much of a profession. I, I really can't see it pushing humanity forward. You know, and if I restored broken spoons, now that would be a different matter. You see, someone would say, uh, look up in the yellow pages there and find out uh, the spoon restorer. See if they're there. Yeah, here he is right here. Can you come up this afternoon? i got four broken spoons here. Yeah, I'll be right there. You know? But they don't phone you up and say, i got a whole bunch of spoons. Might you come over and break some? <laughs> Seems rather useless to me. Well, I have a spoon here, and I guess it's uh, stainless steel Korea, it says. I, have, uh, I was going to ask if there's someone near to the stage. <laughs> Silly me. Okay. <laughs> This good-looking man with a beard right here, you can sit right where you are and just reach up like this, like the Statue of Liberty, that's fine, and hold on to each end of the spoon like that in your fingers. Would you be so kind? Turn that a little bit like that. So that, That's right. You do this so well. It's amazing, really. I'm going to stroke on the spoon very gently like this. Just rub it around with my poor finger and my thumb, and you're going to see a miracle of the semi-religious nature take place. That's it. Now look at this. It seems, uh, hold on. That's it. Does it seem to be getting flexible? Does it look like it too? Don't hold it too tight. Just spread the very, very tips out as far as you can. And the very tippy tippy, that's it. Oh, you do so well. Look at this. Doesn't it appear to be getting rubbery? That's how you start. Let go of it for a second here. I'm just going to hold it right where everyone can see it. I know it's difficult because I've got people all around me here. Look at this. Couldn't you swear that's getting rubbery? <laughs> the illusion is very strong. It really is. In fact, some people even say that it seems to lean over this way. Well, that's probably imagination entirely, I would imagine, yes. It seems to get all limp and wobbly. Look at this, and it seems to just sort of turn liquid <laughs> right in front of you. Hold your hands out. You know, they don't lie out flat like that. Oh, <laughs> and there's boom, a miracle of a semi-religious nature. Look at that. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Now, this is a conjuring trick. Mr. Geller and other spoon benders around the world, that most useful of all professions, they often tell you, that they do this by divine power, some sort of supernatural or occult power. That may be. But also it may be that uh, Richard Nixon doesn't know what happened to the tape. <clears throat> there are lots of possibilities in life, after all. We mustn't pass any of them up. I can only tell Mr. Geller and the other spoon vendors that they're doing it by divine power. They're doing it the hard way. I'll tell you that. Now, I'm going to do another demonstration for you that's been made famous by some of the psychics. And it involves a gentleman's wristwatch. I have to borrow a gentleman's wristwatch, one with hands on it. I mean, a real watch, you know, one of those old-fashioned kind. You, you have a watch. May I borrow that one? Uh, I promise not to damage it too badly. Okay. Very good. Now, this is, a, this is a Seiko. I have it. Look at that. I have a Movado. Isn't that strange? The psychics point out anything as being something miraculous, so I might as well help them along. Now, you happen to have Roman numerals on here. I'm going to ask you a funny question. Do you know how they make the Roman numeral four on that watch? I'll cover it with my thumb so you can't see it. How was the figure four made on that watch? No, they didn't have any ones. They only had letters. You mean four eyes? How many agree with that? A couple, yeah. 
You're absolutely right. See, there's four eyes on there. On a watch dial or a clock dial, they make the figure four with four eyes, not an IV like you might suspect. Why do they do this? I don't know. It's a miracle of the semi-religious nature, I guess. I don't know. But the point is that they do this, except on a famous clock in London. What's the name of the clock? No, it isn't. That's the name of the bell on the inside. That's called tower clock. That's what it's called. Uh, do I have another watch that I can use for a comparison? All right, what time do you have now? You have 20, uh, he has 28 minutes before, am I correct? Uh, uh, 23, I'm sorry, 23 minutes before 8 o'clock. And you have what time? 22 minutes before. Well, you'll have to get together and agree on this now. I am going to ask, open up your hand for me flat, the clean one. Well, it's set close. Doesn't make a difference. All right, I'll put it face down in your hand. I put the finger of the other hand on the back of it. Very good. Now, you've written somebody's name on the back of your hand, I see. Oh, and her telephone number, too. Wonder. Now, hold it up where everyone can see it. Watch this. hi -ya! I don't have to do that with the union likes it. No. Did I, did I scare you? I'm sorry about that. Oh, I think I hurt myself. Now, I'm going to hold on. to Don't go over for a second. We'll see if it's uh, not yet. <laughs> Come on, put your hand on now. You're not working hard enough. Rub its belly a little bit like that. You go chick, chick, chick like that. Ooh, 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 that's enough. Not too sensual. I am going to try to make this go all the way up to 8 o'clock, right on the nose, okay? Watch this. hey -ya! Now let me take a peek at it. What time does it say exactly, sir? Exactly? Absolutely exactly. You can take your watch back, and I'll take the applause. I'm going to do it all over again, but this time I'll do it in slow motion and let you catch me, okay? Now you're going to learn a lesson. You're going to learn... The simple lesson that you don't know what to look for, and you don't know when it's about to happen. You don't know what I'm going to do, but now that I've done it, you will know what to look for, and you'll probably catch me at it. If you don't, I will have a subtle cue that I give you. A cue is like a little sign when I'm doing the thing. You see, there are going to be two moments of truth here. What I'll do for the cue is I'll say, ha, like that, you see? Okay? So when you hear that, it means I've just done something. I felt like I did do something right there. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come for you again, but this time I'll do the whole thing in slow motion. All right? I would like to show you a trick of the watch. I better not do that because it'll take all evening. All right? He gives me the watch. The first thing I do is to take it by the strap only and let it flop back and forth from hand to hand. I did this a number of times. Why? Simply because I want to sell them on the idea, the audience, that I'm not really touching that watch, you see. When I do this, subliminally, it just sells to you that I'm not touching the body of the watch. Now, you don't say afterwards, I remember he flopped it around in his hand, he did this with it a lot, and that proved to me that he wasn't touching the watch. No, you don't remember that, but it sells to you psychologically. I'm doing this, and I'm holding my hands in these wimpy positions like this, you see. And that sells to you that I'm not touching the body of the watch. Then I told you the story about Big Ben, right? And I held the watch in my hand like that quite casually. And while I was holding it here, I took the middle finger of this hand, put it under the winding stand, went bark, and pulled it out, you see? But I did like that, and I held it like that, very loosely again, I flopped. You don't notice that that winding stand was out because you're not looking for it, you see? And then I say to you, what time does it say in your watch? And you say, it's now two minutes past eight. And I say, open up, ha, watch. Open up your hand, I go like this, clunk, that's all. Put the watch in your hand. Put your finger on the back of it so you can't turn it over. I'm no fool. <laughs> and then I go to, hi -ya, hi -ya. oh, I think I hurt myself, etc. And then I take it back and I use the weapon that is the greatest weapon that the magicians and the psychics use. It's called lying. <laughs> because as you see, it now says half past eight and a little bit more, you see. But I turn it like this and I say, not yet. And I lie to you because it's already moved, right? Take it back on your hand. I put it back. You haven't looked at it. You see, you put it back with your finger. And hi -ya, hi -ya, and I do the whole thing. He caught me. Because you see, while you weren't looking, it's now quarter past nine. I did it again. So there. <laughs> now, folks, I did that for you because I want you to learn this one lesson. I brought you here tonight to, I hope, entertain you a little bit. But more importantly, on behalf uh, the New Zealand skeptics, I wanted to prove to you a point. The point is that you don't know what to look for. I don't expect scientists to know conjuring tricks, but I do expect scientists to, from time to time, 
when they think it's necessary to call in the conjurers and ask their advice. They've done that on many occasions, and we've uncovered a number of purported psychics, people who claim they had psychic powers, and we've shown that they're simply doing tricks. Now, most of them aren't. Most of them are quite innocent. Most of them are like the dowsers. They really think they have the powers, but they don't get any feedback, which ever proves one way or the other whether or not they have the powers, you see? I'm going to show you a piece of videotape. This videotape, I've got to tell you some of the genesis of it. In the United States, we are absolutely plagued by, oh, I thought it was going to be a nice day. We are absolutely plagued by people that are known as, well, the TV evangelists, first of all. Many of those are doing what they call faith healing. What they'll do is they'll call people forward, strike them on the forehead with their hands. These people will collapse into the arms of the attendants who are standing there, and they say, be healed in the name of Jesus, and they force them down to the ground, and people believe it. And people go there by the tens of thousands every Sunday to churches all over the United States of America, and videotapes are made of it, and they're broadcast on channel after channel. Now, in my home in Florida, I have access to 70 TV channels. Most of the channels are either taken over by religious entities of one kind or another, some sort of, uh, of minister or priest or doctor something or other, or Baba so-and-so. These people are taking over on all of these smaller channels, lesser important channels. They pay good money for it, and they get huge fortunes out of it. I'm going to show you a videotape that involves a man named Peter Popoff. Peter Popoff was very successful at the time that I found out what one of his gimmicks was. But I must explain to you what the general gimmick is that they all use by doing a short imitation of a man named W.B. Grant. Well, suppose this is the FM microphone that he carries around in his hand. And he will be wandering up and down in the aisles, and Grant will do this. He'll say, uh, Jesus tells me, Bill. Why, why, why am I saying Bill? There's a gentleman sitting here in a wheelchair. And this fellow holds up his hand. He said, oh, what is your name? He says, my name is Bill. He said, did you tell that to me or anyone, Bill? He says, no, I didn't. And I see the number six and a number one and a number four. A six and a one. What does that mean to you, Bill? I live at 614 Tate Avenue. Yes, it's above a door. And there's an angel above that door, too. Do you know that, Bill? Bill says, hallelujah, praise Jesus. And he says, yes. And you don't have to go back and see Dr. Gladstone at Grace Hospital and tell him about that arthritis. What is your doctor's name? Dr. Gladstone. What hospital is he at? He's at Grace Hospital. What do you have as an ailment? He says, I've got arthritis in the knees. He says, yes, praise Jesus, and now it's gone. Do you know that, Bill? It's gone. I want you to stand up out of that wheelchair and run over there and touch that wall right there, Bill, and come back and tell us who healed you. It's Dr. Jesus going to heal you. The crowd goes wild, tears coming down their faces. They're screaming, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, praise the Lord, etc. The man gets up out of the wheelchair, runs over, touches the wall, comes back, is about to sit down in the wheelchair, and Grant grabs him and says, wait a minute, Bill, is that your wheelchair? And he says, yes, it is, Reverend. He says, you don't need that wheelchair, do you? And he says, no, I certainly don't. And they take it and they throw it aside, not too violently, but they throw it aside, and Bill sits down in a regular chair. Why doesn't he throw that wheelchair so violently because it belongs to Grant. Grant has 30 to 40 wheelchairs that come out of a huge truck before each one of the evangelical meetings, unloads them, Bill comes down the aisle two hours previous to the performance. That is the service, pardon me. And who rushes up to him? Mrs. Grant goes rushing up to him and says, how do you do? I'm Mrs. Grant. What is your name? He says, my name is Bill. And if you've got a problem that Jesus is going to heal for you today? And he says, yes, I've got arthritis in the knees. Do you see a doctor? Because, you know, Jesus made doctors, too. Ha, ha, ha. And he says, yes, he's, I do. He says, why don't you fill out this card with your name and address, the name of your doctor in your hospital here, your bank account number, your address, all of these things. Fill that out, and I'll take it back, and we'll put you on the mailing list in the computer, and you'll get our monthly magazine. It's in full color, and it's free. And he says, okay, I don't mind if I do. Oh, by the way, why don't you sit in this wheelchair? Then I can bring you up to the front, and when Reverend Grant comes out, he'll know that you're here for healing. It makes it much more convenient for the reverend. Oh, don't mind if I do. And she wheels him up to the front. Bill has never been in a wheelchair before in his life. <laughs> has never needed a wheelchair. But the impression given to everybody who comes in there is that that man came in that wheelchair. That's a very strong impression. It's not said in so many words, but that's a very strong impression. Now, what is Grant actually doing? He says that he is demonstrating what they call the word of knowledge. That God gives certain anointed ministers the ability to know things about people without being told. And when Grant says, did you tell that to me or to anyone? It's true, he didn't tell that. He wrote it down. It was taken backstage. 
He doesn't connect it with that at all. And not only that, if he suspects it, he's not only not about to say anything about it, but Grant has the microphone. If he sees he's going to say, yeah, but I wrote it down, that microphone comes away pretty fast. <laughs> and remember, this is being videotaped, and if the episode doesn't turn out well, if that man goes over and collapses against the wall, they don't use that part of the videotape, and Grant screams at him, you haven't held the healing. The devil got to you and took away that healing. And it's that man's fault, not Grant's, and it's not God's fault either. It's his fault, because he didn't have the faith. Then we came upon Peter Popoff. Peter Popoff was not only calling out the name of the, of the man and the street address and such, he was calling out much more. He knew everything. And he didn't do what Grant did, which was carry around a Bible and every now and then look into the Bible, say, praise Jesus, what he's reading on that piece of paper in the Bible the little slip there sticking out of the Bible says, Bill, Dr. Gladstone, Grace Hospital, arthritis on these, red shirt, first person on the third row. <laughs> That's how he was doing it. But with Reverend Popoff, he didn't have any Bible. And I said to the colleague who was with me at the time, I said, Steve, I have an idea he's getting information somehow. Why don't you go and take a look in his ear? Steve wandered down there. I didn't dare because I'm recognized sometimes. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Steve wandered down there, went over to Reverend Popoff while he was screaming at the crowd, and came back and said, yeah, he's wearing a hearing aid. Well, that got me thinking. So we finally found out what the gimmick was. You're about to see it in a moment. We found out what it was, and I went to the state attorney in California. I said, Joe, I had lunch with him. I said, Joe, we've got to do something about this. This man is, is a crook. He's defrauding these people. He's using a technical gimmick. He's not genuine at all, and he's not even a reverend. We looked up his records. He's not affiliated with any religious order whatsoever. And Joe looked at me, Joe Rossellino, state attorney for California, and he said, but I can't come out against him. I'm an elected official. I don't come out against reverend anybody. I don't care whether they're reverends or not. Those people who vote for me think he's a reverend. They'll never reelect me. You see, politicians in that country, and perhaps in this country, are much more interested in being reelected than in doing what they were elected for in the first place. And Joe Russellino was one of those people, so I had to go over his head, and I did. I went way over Joe's head, excuse me if I step on your ear. I went all the way to Johnny Carson's television show. <laughs> where is it? Play, uh, this must be it right here. No, that's stop. Um, where the heck is it? Where does it say play? Play, very good. Would you press that for me? Oh, you're very good. I like your work. We can bring down the lights now. I think the tape will play. I hope. Let's see. Well, we researched Peter Popoff very, very well, and Mr. Popoff, pardon me, Reverend Popoff, is not going to be very happy with this, I don't think. You're going to see, first of all, a short segment of tape, as you would see it if you're watching it at home. This is what Popoff featured on his own program. You will apparently see a healing. Now, we went to Houston, Texas, and we discovered that the man was wearing, of all things, a hearing aid in his left ear, and a man, man who heals the deaf, Popoff himself. Oh, I see. And a man who heals the deaf and the blind isn't going to have much use for a hearing aid. One would think, if God is speaking to him, maybe someone else is speaking to him. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we got to San Francisco, we put uh, this fellow, Alec uh, Jason, as an, ex uh, an expert in electronics and a surveillance man, and he put a scanner, an electronic scanner on it, and we picked up something interesting. But first, let's look at the first cut of tape. All right, this is the tape, as you would see it if you were watching the show. Okay, watch the monitors. Who is Harold? I just believe that God is going to burn those cataracts off of your eyes right now. Three, four, seven, eight, eight, Foothill Drive. I tell you, the angels of God are round about your home. Oh, just take those glasses off and put your eyes. If you've got cataracts, if you've got glaucoma i want you just to put your hand over your eyes as i pray for these precious ones sister you've got eye problems to take your glasses off lay your hands on your eyes here it comes to god is going to give these precious ones divine surgery right now right now jesus that's it that's the anointing of the holy ghost praise god Praise God. I'll tell you, the anointing is flowing through this place. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, now let's recap what we've seen here. Right. These two people who were there had not met Popoff before right. themselves. Never spoken to them. 
and yet he calls out his name, and then he called out a number or something? He called out their address. Their address. And they're astonished to hear this, because they didn't tell him. But what you don't know is that his wife has been touring around the audience, getting into conversation. Is Jesus going to heal you today? I see. Where do you live? This kind of thing. And they've filled out healing cards in advance of the program and handed them in there. Now backstage, and someone is sitting at a transmitter backstage. Let's see that same segment again. But now you will have the advantage of knowing what Peter Popoff is hearing in his left ear through a hearing aid. Jerry Reed. Is it Jerry? Reed. Reed, is it Reed? Jerry Reed? It's a woman. She's praying for her husband, Harold. Who is Harold? He's got cataracts. I just believe that God is going to burn those cataracts off of your eyes right now. They live at 34788 Foothill Drive. 34788 Foothill Drive? I tell you, the angels of God are round about your home. Just take those glasses off and put your eyes. If you've got cataracts, she's got, she's got eye if problems too. You've got glaucoma. I want you just to put your hand over your eyes as I pray for these precious. W Sister, you've got eye problems to take your glasses off. Lay your hands on your eyes. Here it comes. To God is going to give these precious ones divine surgery. Right now, right now, Jesus. You know, that is, um, that's disturbing when you see it. It is indeed. You tend to laugh at it, uh, and yet these people obviously are so impressed with what's going on. Oh, they're absolutely impressed. You see people collapse from the floor, tears running down their faces, believing that uh, their kids with drug addiction are going to be healed now because he knew their name. He says he's talking to God, that God speaks directly to him because he's an anointed man of fear. And one, three things amaze me about that. First of all, it turns out that God's frequency, I didn't know he used radio, yeah. is 39.170 megahertz. And God is a woman, obviously, and sounds exactly like Papa's wife, Elizabeth. Has he seen this tape, though? No, he does not know about this until this very moment. Interesting. Okay, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Now, um, the bad news, folks, is that uh, though Peter Popoff went bankrupt within a matter of three or four weeks following that broadcast. He went bankrupt after having brought in for several years previous to that, according to his comptroller, who turned over all the records to us on a roll of computer paper, he was bringing in at the time that program went on the air $4.3 million a month tax-free. And I'm talking American dollars. Doesn't make much difference when you get into those amounts, does it? $4.3 million a month, and he pays no taxes on it. How that man could go bankrupt, I really don't know, because if you make that kind of money, I don't think there's anyone in this room makes that kind of money. Well, there may be an exception, right? so, you know, you know. but uh, only close to it, only close to it. Isn't that astonishing, folks? And the man is back in business. He's not on TV. He's only on radio. He's changed his name from Peter Popoff Ministries to People United for Christ, and you can hardly argue with that. But he doesn't use his name anymore, but he's back in business. Harold? Who's Harold? Yeah. Isn't that an appealing voice? That's what we're plagued with in the United States, and I got some news for you, friends. They're on their way over here. They've announced already they're coming to Australia. They're going to bring that kind of a wonderful cultural improvement to Australia, and they're going to take that kind of money out of Australia, and next they'll be here, or they may even stop over here on their way to Australia. Who knows? I'm sorry? They are? I was afraid of that. <laughs> I get a big dose of insecticide or something if I were you, because there are going to people, be people out there who will fall for it. Now, why are they so successful? They're so successful because they interpret holy writ, if you will, the way they want to, and they convince people that they have some sort of supernatural power by doing tricks just like that. Later on, I'm going to show you a bit of psychic surgery as well, and that will really turn you off. Uh, there may be people just ah, swooning out in the audience. It's pretty bloody stuff. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you about, uh, first of all, why people believe in that sort of thing. It's because of the testimony they get from people. Testimony like that is extracted uh, from people like that is extracted very easily. They ask them to come backstage and they say, we got an affidavit here, we want you to bear testimony. We want you to sign these pieces of paper here. Now, how did it feel when you were healed? Oh, I felt a rush all through my body. Was it sort of a warm rush? Yes, it was like a warm rush. And then your eyesight immediately improved. Did it? Oh, yes, it was much better. 
you could probably read a newspaper after that. No, I couldn't read a newspaper. But if you really tried, you could have read a newspaper, couldn't you? Well, I suppose I could have. Uh, yes, you could read. Obviously, you could read a newspaper if you tried, but you didn't try. No, I didn't really try. But you're sure you're capable of it. Oh, yes, I guess. I, you see what they're doing? They're talking them into it. And, folks, that's exactly the technique that is being used as it was used in the Salem witch trials way back in the early days of Massachusetts in the United States when people were being hanged because they were witches. Where did they get the evidence for it? Didn't see anybody flying around on a broomstick, but you did have little children who were convincing other people after being cued and rehearsed and badgered by religious folks who thought that they were actually being affected by witches, local people, that they didn't care for very much. That old lady down the lane there looks evil to me. That's exactly what was going on. They talked to these kids again and again and again for hours and hours and hours until they got the story out of them. And don't think it isn't happening today. All this nonsense that you're hearing all over the world, particularly in the United States, in California, in the state of Massachusetts again, in New Jersey, and in the state of New York, all over the state of New York, towns all over the place are coming up with satanic abuse. Terrible things where children are kept in dungeons and whipped and chained to the wall. Terrible things are done to them. Animals are sacrificed in front of them. These kids, in a while, will begin to believe that sort of thing, and some of them do right now. And they're years after they first were told about it by the questioners. Didn't he do this to you? No, he didn't do that to me. Are you sure he didn't? Don't you remember it? And they don't let them off the hook, and they don't let them out of the room until they badger them and say, yes, 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 it did happen. And the next day when they come back, it's fresh in their minds, and they go to court and they tell stories about these people. Believe me, this is criminal. It's unethical, it's immoral, and it's something that you should really try to put a stop to it. It is ridiculous that they can force children into doing this kind of thing, of telling stories about others that are not true. Now, there may be a germ of truth in it from time to time. There doubtless is, in many cases, a germ of truth, and sometimes more than just a germ. But you cannot convince me there's an epidemic of Satanism sweeping the world in which all of these people are doing these strange rituals when there's not one bit of physical evidence for it. Not a scrap, not an injury, not a dead animal, nothing to prove it. And yet it seems to be very evident. Would little children lie? Yes. And they do, especially when they're coerced to do so. Now I'm about to show you some quackery that is taking place right here in New Zealand. And it's going to shock some of you. It's called homeopathy. Oh, really? I thought that was sort of a naturalistic thing where you eat herbs and things like that. Yes, you take good natural food and cornflakes and things that look like packing material and you eat them every day with skim milk. <laughs> I thought that was homeopathy. Isn't it one of those natural things? No, you know what homeopathy is, folks? It is drinking pure distilled water with magic in it. Well, how do we get the magic into it? Well, you just declare it to be magic. Well, no, it's not quite that simple. They wouldn't charge you that much for water if they just sort of talked to the water. Oh, in Russia, they're doing that. They talk to the water via television. You put a bottle of water on top of your television receiver in Moscow, and you tune in Channel 3, and this faith healer appears there and looks up above the camera like this at the mic. He's ning, 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 and he does this kind of thing. And then you drink the water, and you feel much better. Well, we're not that naive, are we? No, sorry. You wouldn't find anybody in New Zealand falling for that. No, we're sophisticated folks. Those Russians, what do they know? Don't fool yourself, folks. You are falling for it every day of your lives. And there are stores out there that are going to sell you homeopathic medicine. Let's look at what homeopathic medicine really is. I'll take you 220 years into the past. Um, Paracelsus, is, his influence is still known. Paracelsus was quite a guy. He was, uh, uh, well, he had a big, long name, about that long. Very boring name. But he was quite a guy. He came along with some wonderful notions. The first notion he had in medicine was that you can give inorganic compounds instead of plant compounds, organic compounds, natural compounds. You can give inorganic compounds to people, and that might help them. And some of the medicines he gave them did help them. On the other hand, there were things like mercuric chloride, lead acetate, and a few things like that. Uh, they aren't good for you, folks. They're what they call poisonous. <laughs> now, the symptoms cleared up right away, but the patients, unfortunately, died. <laughs> but he did boast that he had the best-looking corpses in the morgue, though. Very serene, clear complexions, the whole thing. No symptoms, but dead. Well, we've got to get rid of that side effect. That's uh, <laughs> rather serious. But seriously, Paracelsus was, and, and well, in many ways, a fool. 
but in many ways a genius at the same time. And he really got medicine out of a rut and started to make it into a science. It was very rough on some of the people he experimented on. They hadn't used white rats and rabbits in those days. They used real people. There were lots of them around. Well, then about that same time, along came a man named Samuel Hahnemann. He had a bright idea. He found out that most people who didn't go to doctors in that day, he was from Switzerland, he found out that most people who didn't go to the doctors were surviving at a greater rate than those who were rich enough to pay the doctors. Because the doctors were still giving him uh, a calomel and various things like that, had mercury in it, and that was fatal, of course, in the long run. So he decided that he would uh, develop a theory. And the theory, now I can't go through the whole theory of homeopathy with you here today, but I'll give you five or six of the main elements, okay? This is sort of a, a crash course on homeopathy. First of all, it's based on, first thing, the law of similars. What could that be? Well, let me tell you. The law of similars says that if you take a well patient, I don't know how you define that, but a person who's not sick, and you give them substance X, Substance X could be, oh, uh, extract of dandelion or something like that, okay? Squeeze the dandelion, take this. And when they take that, it makes, uh, you've got old symptoms A, B, and C. Most of those symptoms are getting red rash all over your body, uh, falling down every 20 minutes in a dead faint, and your, your head swells up like a balloon, okay? Now, those are symptoms you'd probably notice. So substance X given to a healthy person causes A, B, and C in the way of symptoms. So you make a note in your book, and you forget about it for the while, a couple of years later, a fellow walks into your, your office and he says, Doctor, I feel terrible. The doctor looks at him and says, Boy, your face is all swollen up like a balloon. He says, That's right. Got any other symptoms? Yeah, look at this. Red rash all over my body. He says, Don't tell me you fall down to faint. He says, Yes, doctor. Every 20 minutes I fall down to dead faint. Wait a minute. Next extract of dandelion. Right here, take this and you'll recover. And that's what the law of summary says, that if you give it to a person who has the symptoms, it reverses it, and the person becomes well. Well, it's a naive theory, and it doesn't work, but it sounded good. But you see, you've got to know the second law of homeopathy, which is you don't actually give them the substance. No, you don't really give them extract of dandelion. You give them highly diluted extract of dandelion. And yet that's not quite true, because it's not diluted. Well, I'll tell you what it is. I'll demonstrate it for you. Step to the board, like any did. Now, a little mathematics lesson. 10 to the power of 1 is 10. 10 to the power of 2 is 100. In other words, the little number up here, the power of the number, shows the number of zeros after it, okay? Well, what they do in homeopathy is they take one part of the substance and they put it with nine parts of water and they success it. That means, that's fancy medical talk for shaking. You shake it like this, like this, back and forth. And then that's a solution, that's a one solution. And this is very rough, very rough. I'm not giving you the exact details of homeopathy, but you success it and that's a one solution, okay? Then you take one part of that and put it in nine parts of water. That's got to the same thing again. You success it. That's a two solution. You take one part of that and you put it, you see what you're getting? By the time you've got a three solution, you've got one part of substance in 1,000 parts of water. And you keep going. By the time you get to 10 to the 23rd or 24th, you have reached what they call Avogadro's limit which means that in that solution, you only have there a chance of there being one molecule of the original substance. So by the time you get to the 24th or the 25th, you've got one chance in 10 of there being one molecule of the substance there. In other words, you've got pure water. And where do they start? They usually start at a dilution of 10 to the 50th. There are 10 to the 27th stars in the universe. That'll give you an idea how dilute that is. And you see, the words they use are highly diluted or highly attenuated solutions. But they're not even solutions, because a solution has to have a solvent and a solute. It's got none of the solute, but it's still got the magic, they say. The substance once was in this water. And not only that, the next rule says of homeopathy, the more diluted it is, the more powerful it is. How about them apples? Hey! <laughs> so at 10 to the 23rd or 24th, depending on the size of the molecule, you come to Avogadro's limit. But there's only one molecule probably in there. They go all the way. I'm glad you're seated, most of you. Those who aren't, don't, don't, don't fall down, please. <coughs> they go all the way up to 10 to the power of 1,500. <laughs> that goes all the way out of the place. Now, I called my friend Martin Gardner, formerly of Scientific American. He used to write their recreations and mathematical recreations column. 
And I said, Martin, I speak to the lay public and I speak to scientists and everything. Either one of them is not going to understand quite what I mean by 10 to the power of 1,500 when it's diluted down like that. Can you give me some sort of practical metaphor or similar, something that I can... And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll call you back. Called me back 20 minutes later. He said, okay, I got it for you. I don't believe it, but here it is. He paused for a minute and I said, what's the matter? He said, I better call you back. That can't be right. <laughs> he called me back almost immediately and said, yeah, it was right. And I hope you're ready for it, folks. A, a solution of 10 to the power of 1,500, in other words, a 1,500 homeopathic remedy that you could buy in a homeopathical, homeopathical pharmacy, pure distilled water. It may say mercury, it may say lead, it may say arsenic, strychnine. Don't pay any attention. There isn't any of it in there, but that's what they call it, you see. That's equivalent to taking one grain of rice, one, uno, eins, in. One grain of rice, crushing it to a powder, dissolving it in a sphere of water the size of the solar system <laughs> with the sun at the center and the orbit of Pluto at the outside, and then repeating that process two billion times. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, that's dilute. But what I can't figure out, I really, I'm, I, maybe you can help me on this. How the hell do you stir it? <laughs> Everyone's going to notice it because they say, wow, they're making homeopathic medicine again. You, know? you get a very big stick. If so, where does the stick come from? Alpha Centauri, don't tell me. Is it? Well, folks, that's how silly homeopathy is. And wait a minute, I haven't given you the really good news about it. Homeopathy says that any molecule of water that's part of that medicine, if it comes in contact with any other molecule of water, immediately passes on the magic. So I've got a question for them. It seems that they treat this as if I'm some sort of idiot. Why could I ask a question like, what? you're such a silly person, James, Randy. Why do you ask dumb questions like that? You judge for yourself whether it's dumb. They say it's a dumb question. I say water's been around for a long time. As Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions of years. You know? <laughs> That means that all molecules of water on Earth today, let us say were just created yesterday afternoon around 4 o'clock, have come in contact with all known substances, inorganic, unorganic, or with some molecule that has come in touch with all of those substances. So ordinary tap water, swamp water, any kind of water, rain, is going to be very powerful because it's even more dilute than 1,500. So any drop of water is going to do the job. No wonder you feel so good when you drink water, right? I'm going to drink a whole bathful tonight, and I'll get so healthy you wouldn't be able to stand me. <laughs> well, that's what homeopathy is really all about. But then, then they say, but wait a minute, it cures. How do you explain that? It appears to, because people who take the medicine many times recover. But they don't bother to run a control group whereby the people don't take the medicine to see if they still recover. 85% of the ailment, ailments that people go to doctors with don't require the intercession of the doctor. But it's a very good idea to go anyway because it might be within the 15% that does require that. 85% of ailments are self-terminating in that the body does the job. And in the 15% that are left, you need some sort of medical intercession, such things as diabetes, for example. But people with diabetes go to the doctor and say, cure me. He says, gee, I'm sorry, I can't. What do you mean you can't? You're a doctor. This is a disease. You know what it is. Heal me. Well, I can give you some insulin if you want, or some oral insulin, whatever, medicines, injections, that sort of thing. You have to take them regularly, though, for the rest of your life. I don't want to hear that. I'd rather go to the faith healer. And that's exactly what they do. Because what do those people like Peter Popoff advertise? And they do it all the time. They say things like, God doesn't want to put chemicals in your body. God doesn't want to cut on your body with a knife. He wants to heal you with the spiritual touch. Ding. And there you go. That's the appeal of the faith healers. That's the appeal of these people who promise you something that's not going to work, but they'll take your money for it in the same way the acupuncturists will, in the same way that chiropractors will pretend that they can heal Diseases caused by bacterial infection. Oh, they can manipulate your spine, make you feel great if you got a bad back. Yeah, they have a limited use. They certainly do. But they cannot do what most of them advertise they can do, which is everything in medicine. And most of them do make that claim. 
If they don't, they got my blessing. If they advertise what they can actually do, I have no objection to it. But most of the time, they don't. Now I'm going to show you a videotape of some people that are really deadly. Peter Sellers, great actor and comedian, dead. Why? He could be alive today. Certainly. Wasn't that old. Had a bad heart. Went to his doctor. The doctor says, got to have open heart surgery. You need a triple bypass. He said, nope, don't want to do that. I'm going to the psychic healers in the Philippines. Really? Well, for three years, according to his biography, he went there twice a year, every six months, regularly. They operated on his chest. Their hands seemed to penetrate his chest, brought out all kinds of tumors and such. He told everyone about it, wrote it up in his autobiography, and said, oh, it's wonderful. I saw them reach into my chest and take these wonderful things out, these tumors that were bothering me, blood clots, all sorts of things. Oh, they cured him, all right, for three years until the condition got so bad that he collapsed on a film set in London, took him off to the hospital, operated on him. Too late, we lost Peter Sellers. We lose 10 to 15,000 people a year to the psychic healers in the Philippines who go from New Zealand, don't think they don't. They go from Australia, they go from Japan, they go from Canada, from the United States, from England. They fly there in chartered jets, jets full of people who are not going to pay for the service, I must admit that. They don't get charged any fees. Oh, they are given envelopes with quantities of money written on, like $500 for a charity, $115 here, and $1,500 there. They get handed these envelopes for love offerings, but they don't charge them. But if they don't put the money in the love offering, they're probably not going to get treated. Gee, I guess we better put some money in the pot just in case. And what do they do? Sleight of hand. I'm going to show you this videotape now, and if anyone in the room is really nervous about seeing blood and guts, you may not want to watch this, which means that everybody's going to be <laughs> totally fixed. There's not going to be a soul here missing a frame of it, I'm sure. But it is pretty gory. It's real blood and guts, but it does not come from the man on the table. The man on the table was a volunteer from the audience. We went to the, the audience waiting outside to get into one of the Carson shows, and we asked him if he'd volunteer. He was there celebrating his first anniversary. As I said to him at the end of the anniversary, I have no idea what you're going to do for your second anniversary. Your bride better be happy with it. You may have to set yourself on fire and go over Niagara Falls or something like that. <laughs> Having your guts torn out on American television so the whole nation can see you is a sort of um, a drastic step. So you're going to see some blood. I will warn you again on the screen. Mr. Carson will warn you on the screen. We did have a pass out in the audience, and that little bit about, ah, is not really a joke, because some people do, and if somebody starts to slip in the chair beside you, just grab them. They'll be okay. Nobody's ever died during this demonstration. <laughs> I don't think. And um, one lady did pass out in the green room backstage. We found her, ah, swooned away. So you're going to see this videotape now. Take it with a grain of salt. And I do make a joke halfway through the thing just to try to take the edge off it, because people were getting pretty tense. They laugh, but it's nervous laughter, and there may be some nervous laughter here, too. They didn't much care for what they were seeing, so... For the people who might just have tuned in, uh, a little word of warning here. Uh, if you have a queasy stomach, the sight of blood bothers you, we suggest you don't watch this. This is James Randi, who's going to give you an idea of what the psychic surgeons in the Philippines actually do on people who go down there and pay good money. You all set? Indeed. All right, all right. we have our patient. It's all yours. Oh, okay. Now, this is the time to look away if you, if you need to, because it's going to get a little gory from now on. The psychic surgeons of the Philippines are, um, how you doing, Sandy? Okay? Everything's fine. They're pretty heartless folks. They just don't much care for the feelings of people. They don't certainly care for their health at all. And, of course, they're not in any way trained to do this sort of thing. They just put on an act as if they are trained. Now, what you're about to see is a barehanded operation which appears to take place by actually penetrating the body. Believe me, what you're seeing is strictly special effects, it's sleight of hand, and nothing more. And this is the way it looks. It's down there. We don't get it on your trousers if we can help it. Um, let me see.
worse and worse. In a second now. It, ah. <laughs> oh, no, that doesn't come out. Better, just a second. Just one second now. Maybe better for you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't feel any better? The strange thing is, after this operation is all over, now, mind you folks, I want you to bear in mind, please, that people are showing this as if it were really serious, as if it actually did take place, and as if surgery were really performed. People do this, they go to the Philippines, they spend their money, and they frankly return home, in most cases, to die. It's a little bit funny to watch it, perhaps, and you say, gee, I know it's play acting. It's not play acting when they go by the tens of thousands every year. Sanford, I want to thank you for being a wonderful volunteer. I think you deserve a round of applause for that. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'll give you a minute. That demonstration um, was effective, I suppose, for a lot of people. The station that did that was the NBC network right across the United States. In Los Angeles, they got just over 200 calls. He sent something like 204 calls immediately following the broadcast. Every one of the calls asked, how do you locate these people in the Philippines? <laughs> Every last one of them. And why is that? Because people who do learn the lesson of this sort of thing, they don't call in. It's not that everybody in the United States is stupid. It may appear that way occasionally but it's not necessarily true. After all, I didn't vote for Nixon. <laughs> it's a selective process, you see. People who agree with you, people who do learn the lesson, who do listen to what you've got to say, aren't the people who call in. The people who call in are the people who look and say, oh, that looks great, Charlie. Should we go? Yeah, let's get a ticket, and we'll go off, and we'll have somebody operated on. It's pretty sad, folks, because they go there with the tens of thousands every month. That place is jammed. Baguio, the only business in Baguio in the Philippines that exists right now pretty well is psychic surgery. Tens of millions of dollars every year in donations made to these people who are simply charlatans. What you saw on that screen is much better than what they do. They don't do it that well at all. I do it much better than they do, and I certainly don't make any money out of it, I can tell you that. It's pretty sad stuff. Now I have to show you what they call a, a miracle of a semi-religious nature, perhaps. There's a young lady in the audience I asked to cooperate. I her up. Oh, there she is, right there. Um, what is your name? I didn't get your name, sorry. Right? Oh, okay. This young lady, I uh, accosted her outside in a nice way, of course. I asked her outside when uh, the audience was coming in, right at the very beginning. I said, uh, Would you like to do a little experiment with us? And she said, Well, okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I said, Well, step into my office, young lady. I so we, uh, we actually went into the classroom across the way there. I don't remember the name of the ma I got a magazine from the hotel, from the desk of the hotel before I left. Do you remember the name of the magazine? What was it? Oh, Sky, just Sky. That's a simple name. I could remember that, I guess, if I tried. Uh, Sky Magazine, it's about the Sky uh, satellite thing, the service, the movies and stuff like that, uh, in the hotel. I, uh, th what did we say, 46 pages or something was in it, uh, something like that? Yeah, whatever it was. And. Um, I said, I'm going to put you in the classroom there and make sure no one's looking over your shoulder. She was all alone in the classroom. And I said, I'm going to close the door. And after I close the door, I want you simply to turn to any page. You had a free choice of any page. Am I correct? And you went to any page at all. You just leafed through there. And I said, I want you to put your finger down and just run around a circle like that and stop. You did that, did you? Okay. And whatever word you stopped at, 
I want you to remember that word, okay? And that was a word that was a random word because you turned any page at all and just ran your finger around. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, and you chose a word. Yeah, and you remembered what it was. Now, you do, you do remember, don't you? You know what I hate? And I say afterwards, is that the word? You say, gee, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you remember it. Okay. Now, are you the only person that could possibly know what that word is? Absolutely. You didn't tell anybody, did you? Because I said as she left, I said, don't you tell anybody you're breaking a red rash all over your body. And I don't see a red rash all over your body, so I guess you did. Did she ask? I mean, did you ask? Did you ask? You didn't? I'll bet you didn't. Yeah. But I asked you to fold that piece of paper up, tear it out of the book, and fold it up and put it in your pocket. Am I correct? And you've had it there ever since? Have you unwrapped it since? Okay. You haven't told anybody? And you have that word in mind. Now I'm going to step over to the magic forward here. And see that? How do they do that? I don't know. There are miracles that even I don't understand. There's a little man in the back who's waiting desperately for me to push that up. Now, what I'm going to start to do here is I'm going to start to write on the board, but I'm not going to look at you when I do it because that would be unfair. You see, I'm looking at you, and I might see you going, and I know I was wrong. You see, I might see you going, oh, and that would mean I'm right. You see, so I'm going to start to, to draw or write on here. And I want you to think of what the word looked like when you ran your finger around and stopped at that word, and you looked at the word, and you remembered the word. Now, there, I'm sure there are thousands and thousands of words in there and 46 pages you could have chosen from. Uh, that's a good start. Hey, hey, better than what you could do, I'll bet. <laughs> um, Oh boy, that doesn't make any sense at all. It was an English word, was it? Okay. Um. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. And What was the word that you looked at? I can't hear you, what? Music? Oh, you must have it in your pocket upside down. That must be, you see. You probably had it in your pocket upside down. That probably is it, yes. Could be, eh? Okay. Now, the immediate, won't stand up, all right. Be difficult. Um, the idea that would occur to you, first of all, you're saying, gee, I wonder how he did that. This young lady is quite innocent. She didn't tell me. I didn't force you to take any page or take, force you to take any word, did I? No. She's quite innocent of any guile. We're not in Confederate. She's not my, my daughter or anything like that. And um, I never met the lady before this evening. I want you to start thinking to yourself this most important lesson that I hope you will leave here tonight with. This is important, folks. The most important thing I've got to tell you tonight. It is not the stupid, uneducated, unsophisticated, dense people who fall for this sort of thing and can't figure out how the tricks are done. No, it's folks like you and me. And I don't take myself out of that category at all because I can be deceived as well. It's happened before. Hey, there are magicians around that do stuff that blows me right out of the water. It takes me sometimes days or weeks or months even to figure it out. Oh, I eventually do because that's my trade. I can figure it out, sure, because I know what not to be misdirected by. And you folks don't, and I don't expect you. It doesn't mean that you're dense if you can't figure it out. It means that you're like anyone else. And there are professionals out there that are ready to take your money and your sanity. They will do it if they can, and you mustn't let them do it. Now, I'm going to run over a series of claims that Mr. Uri Geller has made in the past. These are the things he has accomplished for mankind, according to his own history. And I want you to see if you believe that any of these are really useful. He said that the Galileo spacecraft, which went up a couple of years ago, it had a stuck antenna on it. And he said that he went to NASA, and he made an offer to them to unstick that antenna. Not by going up in space, but merely <laughs> concentrating on it, you see? Well, I got a hold of some people at NASA. They said they not only not heard of Mr. Geller, but he made no such offer to them. Gee, 
could that be not true? I wonder. He also invented, he says, a thing called the orange spot. The orange spot is a spot about so big, which is printed in your newspaper. This is very popular in Australia at the moment and in the UK. You haven't been plagued with it yet, I guess, but I guess it'll come here eventually. <coughs> What's the magic uh, spot all about? Well, you see, it's printed in the newspaper after he takes the can of ink that's used and he prays over it. Yeah. Over the can of ink that's going to be used to print the orange spot in the newspaper. And then you put your hand on the orange spot and it will heal you or bring some sort of psychic power to you whereby you can bend spoons or heal the sick or whatever, you know, and you just touch this orange spot. Can you imagine some dummy, you know, getting a newspaper and going, ooh, 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 and touching the orange spot? Well, he said he invented that. I'm sorry, Mr. Geller, you didn't invent it, because two years before you came out with it, it was in the National Enquirer as the blue spot. Now, maybe he invented the orange spot rather than the blue spot. I give him credit for that. But the spot idea and going, ooh, 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 and getting vibrations out of it was not his invention. He also says that he has changed lead into gold. That's called alchemy. And it seems to me that he would probably be doing that very busily right now if he really could do it. Maybe he can. I'm not denying his claim. But it seems rather unusual. He also says that just recently he has discovered the whereabouts of the lost Ark of the Covenant. Well, I wrote to the newspaper in England that came out with this news, and I said you should notify Mr. Geller that Steven Spielberg is not a documentary filmmaker. And that Harrison Ford is merely an actor. He's not really an archaeologist. He just puts on the hat and acts like an archaeologist. He also says, Mr. Geller does, that he helped with the Russian peace talks some time ago. And after all, the USSR did collapse, so maybe he had something to do with that. He put out his vibration, and he made Gorbachev change his mind on something or other. Well, it may be true. He also said that he found uh, some gold for Xanax Corporation in Australia and that 10 other mining companies have paid him a million pounds up front, non-refundable, to find oil and gold for them. Well, I talked to the people at Xanax. They had never heard of Mr. Geller either, but they did say that uh, somebody got in a helicopter and went out with a dowsing stick and went from the helicopter and found them some very nice sand. <laughs> he also said that last year he stopped Big Ben. Oh, really? Well, I wrote to the folks at Big Ben. You see, that's the clock, right? No, you've already learned. It's the bell, you see. And it turns out that the tower clock, which is a proper name for it, stops twice a year. On an average, twice a year. They stop it for maintenance. And sometimes it stops inadvertently because it's a very old mechanism. And they give it a push and get it started again. And he said that he stopped it with the power of his mind. But he forgot to tell us until after it stopped, unfortunately. Now, he also says he's bringing back a camera that was left on the moon by the astronauts. And he also says that he's about to find Lassiter's Reef in Australia. If he does either one of those, I will walk all the way to his home outside London on my knees from here, pushing a peanut with my nose. <laughs> These are preposterous claims, ladies and gentlemen. They're preposterous claims, the kind of claims that are made by psychics and have been made for generations now. You see, I'm going to close this little talk today with the usual speech that I give at the close of all of my magic performances and my lectures. And it goes like this. No, I'm afraid I have to give you bad news. No, there's, there's really no magic, no real magic. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Take that back. Wait. So I, I live in Florida, and there's a morning glory vine right outside my window. I get up very early in the morning, 6.30 or 7, make a cup of coffee, go and sit in the office, fire up the computer, and I look out, and these little blossoms, you know, they're beautiful little trumpet-shaped blue blossoms there. And they're closed at night. You know that? They close up at night. You ever notice that? They close up at night. How do they know to do this? I don't know. I could probably go to a botanist someplace who's written a scientific paper with millions of footnotes and references and other people signing it who know nothing about it whatsoever, but that's what you call a scientific paper. He's probably written a scientific paper on how they do this and how do they open in the morning. I don't know if they open up fast or not. And I sit down in front of the computer and I say, you little devil, I'm going to catch you this morning. I look at this blossom sitting right there, peck, peck, on the computer. I'm not relaxing, just a sip of coffee, very carefully. Not okay. Now, zip, 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 I can in. One more sip of coffee, <laughs> it's open. <laughs> Got me again. Now, I don't know whether it opens up fast or slow. I've never seen it happen, but somehow it knows enough to open up. That's my magic. That's my little bit of magic, and I sort of enjoy it. Looking at a puppy dog, playing with a puppy dog on the rug. Hey, that's magic for me. Little baby over here that I rather adore. Had supper with that baby last night, with the parents, I, I hasten to add. 
hey, that's a charming thing. It's a little miracle, and I enjoy that. See, we skeptics aren't bad folks. We don't go around saying, ain't so, ain't so, ain't so, ain't so. Don't want to believe that. No. We really enjoy our lives, except that we're not going to be taken advantage of. And I ask you to do exactly the same thing. Now, let's go back to that magic. Gee, I can't prove that none of these things exist. People in the audience office pull up their hands and say, can you prove ESP doesn't exist? I say no, and they say, ha, gotcha. I say, no, no, you haven't got me. You, you've got the rules wrong. You see, you claim it does exist. Where's your proof? I'm not saying anything about it. I'm merely saying you haven't proved it. Can you prove a negative? No, you can't prove a negative. Really? I'll give you an example. Santa Claus. You call him Santa Claus here or Father Christmas? Santa Claus. That's close enough. I'm very popular in December. I know some other people around here are very popular in December, too. I, um, I'm going to do a little experiment. I'm going to design an experiment with you right here. Boys and girls, pay attention. I'm going to ask questions later. It'll be a test at 4 o'clock. We're going to test the Santa Claus theory. Let's take one aspect of it, make the experiment very simple. It's a flying reindeer. There's a good one. Hey, eight tiny reindeer fly through the air in the evening on December 24th. I doubt it. Let's do a test. I propose that we get, uh, oh, 10,000 reindeer, okay? Let's do it 1,000 because we've got a small budget. Okay, 1,000 reindeer, number them on the side, one, two, three, and we take them up on top of old the World Trade Center in New York. <laughs> now, please don't laugh. This is science. <laughs> We're going to do an experiment. We've got a video camera there. And we say, okay, it's, uh, what, what's the date here? It's July 6th, okay, July 6th. It's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay, write that down. Start the video camera, got it? Okay, here we go, number one, number one. Make notes now, okay? Temperature, by the way, is so and so and such and such. Atmospheric pressure, such and such. A little overcast, okay, number one. Push. <laughs> uh, write down opposite number one, no. Mm. Whoa. Number two, push. Ooh, uh, same result. Now, folks, I don't know what's going to happen because I haven't done the experiment. I don't really want to do the experiment. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> but based upon my meager knowledge, admittedly meager knowledge, of the aerodynamics of the average reindeer, <laughs> I believe that what I will get is at the foot of the World Trade Center in New York, a pile of very unhappy and broken reindeer. And probably a couple of policemen standing down there, one looking up and saying, I don't know, but here comes another one. <laughs> now, the question is simply this. The question is, have I proven that reindeer can't fly? No. All I have proven is that these 1,000 reindeer on this occasion under these conditions of atmospheric pressure, temperature, location, geographical, time of year, whatever, time of day, these 1,000 reindeer either couldn't fly or chose not to. <laughs> That's true. Now, if the latter, I certainly have proven something about the IQ of the average reindeer. <laughs> but I haven't proven a negative. But that's the test we have to put all of these supernaturalists too. We have to demand that they prove that what they say is true. And we have the right to demand that because they're taking our money for giving them advice, for giving us advice and casting our horoscopes, predicting our future, healing us with all kinds of strange nostrums, with alternate medicine, so-called. They're making claims on us and they're taking our money. So we have the right to demand that. Now, folks, you have a choice, you see. We've gone to the moon. Oh, I don't think there's anybody in this room that's gone to the moon. I certainly haven't, no. But our species has. Hey, some guys got on the end of this huge rocket, and they got shot up in the air, went around the moon a few times, jumped out, and the thing looks like a huge telephone booth on legs, and they landed on the moon, and they got out in funny big white suits, and they walked around, and they picked up pieces of the moon, rocks from the moon, and they put them in their pockets, and they got back in that stupid thing and came back to Earth, and now you can go to major museums all over the world and ask the man at the door, where's the moon rock? He says, fourth floor at the rear. And you go up there, and there's a little pyramid there, a little acrylic thing, and inside, a little point, pointer saying, this is a piece of the moon. Now, isn't that magic? Isn't that as much magic as you need? The fact that our species has jumped a quarter of a million miles out in space to get a piece of the moon and bring it back and say, hey, look what we did. 
and what's beyond the moon? The planets. Oh, maybe not in our lifetime, though I hope. Maybe we'll go to Mars. Some of them don't look very hospitable, that's true. But we gotta go there because they're out there. That's the kind of folks we are. We are a magnificent species. And what's happening meanwhile? The astrologers and the fortune tellers and the ESP artists and the spoon benders are all back here saying, no, you're not all that smart. You are not the independent, capable person that you really are. You are not capable of running your life without me because I can show you miracles and I can lead you on to Nirvana or Valhalla, wherever you want to go. And I've got the horoscope on the wall behind me and the funny hat and the ring in my nose or whatever. And I'm magic and I can make up for all your terrible discrepancies because you're not really a responsible, capable human being. I want you to go back into the caves that your ancestors came from. I don't want you going on to the planets. And hey, I didn't stop at the planets a long time ago. I thought beyond that, and I hope you have too. The stars, they're out there. Sure, we're going to go there eventually. And I can't look forward to it because I don't think anyone in this room will live that long to be able to see us go to the stars. We're going to do it, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to do it. Thank you. Uh, there's, I'll have questions. No questions, right? I think we can. Yeah, a we few. Can? Yeah, let's do a few, yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.